and transition to new ownership through exit and succession. So both of these guys are very, very qualified, so let's give them a big welcome. Pam, hey, thank you very much for inviting us to, to, to be here. Absolutely. To, to share a little bit of uh, knowledge up here. We, uh, we're tag teaming this even though we've never worked together except for this project. Uh, so we have sort of different perspectives and maybe some different stories uh, to bring to the presentation. As a, as a person who's been in the audience for these kinds of presentations, we have 20 slides worth of stuff, but we also want to try to bring in some real life stories as to some of the things we've seen in the real world. Um, mostly I think we'll focus on things not to do with respect to those stories. One makes it go forward. Oh, no, it's not working again. Yeah. <coughs> Would you guys be sharing the slides? Yep. Here we go. No. So I'll, I'll manually work this to this Okay. We can move on to the next one. Sir. subject of cap tables, we thought it would make sense to talk a little bit about the concept that un lays underneath cap tables, and that is basically the company's capitalization, because as most of you know, the cap in cap table stands for capitalization. And the company's capitalization, which is also referred to as capital structure, basically means the classes of shares that it is authorized to issue. And that's sometimes referred to the company's authorized capital. A lot of people don't know where, where to look to find out what a company's authorized capital is. And the place to look is in the, the charter document, which in a California corporation is the Articles of Incorporation. And in a, for a Delaware corporation, it's called the Certificate of Incorporation. And in that document, that's the document that you file with the Secretary of State to, to form the corporation. And it states you know, the name of the corporation, some other basic information like the, the address. And it also states the initial capitalization of the company. This is just one example. They're all over the map, but this is just one example. Some of the numbers that we're going to get into later um, fall for, from, this, from this, this 20 million shares. But you'll see that this company is this company is authorized to issue both common and preferred. Sometimes the initial article is just common, and you don't even authorize preferred until your first preferred deal, in which case you amend the articles prior to the closing of the preferred deal to authorize and create the preferred class and set forth the, um, the terms and preferences and privileges of, of at, least the at least the first series of the preferred. Um, so you'll see the total, this is the, this is the important one, the total number, oops, that's, that's the wrong button. The total number is 20 million shares. So that's the total, until this is amended, that's the total number of shares that the company can issue. And if the board of directors, if the board of directors has the power to authorize issues of shares, that's the number they can go up to. If they go above that number, any, any number above that are, are void. They're just they're invalid shares. And these have, uh, have a power value of a one, one tenth of a cent per share. And you can, you can say with no power value, especially we often do that in California. Um, but this is not really very relevant to the subject of cap tables. But anyway, this, this corporation, we broke down the 20 million shares into 15 million shares of common and five million shares of preferred. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the authorized capital of this corporation until this document is amended. And in many times, it is amended down the road. A couple years down the road, if, 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 you, if you need to raise more capital and you've already used up your authorized capital, it can be amended, as, usually as part of a financing. And, and that's pretty common and, and acceptable. I think that's an important point. I have an entrepreneur who keeps asking me, about the structure of her company cap table and, and, and how they can do things within that. And my first reply is, well, it doesn't have to be within that. <coughs> you can change that. It's not a big deal to change that. So even though it's part of your formal document to file an amendment to change this as, you, as your company goes through its life, is, is not. When would you, uh, when would you go no par value versus putting a number on it? 
Well, you, you usually you want to put like if you're if you're a California corporation, you probably want to put no par value. The concept of par value is kind of an antiquated accounting concept that is not really used very much more in an accounting, but it is used in a lot of states, including Delaware, to calculate your annual franchise tax. Nevada also, and if you don't <coughs> state a par value, if you say no par value, then they will they will assume a par value. And they assume a high par value. I think it's, I think it's a dollar a share, and then they calculate your tax on that. Or it might be one cent a share. But if you if you if you make the mistake and say no par value in Delaware, and you have like 20 million shares, and they, they, they go through the calculations, you, I, I, I've seen people with, with their annual franchise tax say in the, in like the hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and then that creates the mess because then you got to go, oh wait, you know, you got to put on the brakes. I want, I need to amend it. You can, you can, you can get, you know, nobody ever actually has to pay that much of a tax, but. It's, it's a royal hassle to get out of that. So that's why sometimes I make it better to say a really low par value than no par value, because then, then they don't default to the high par value. There's the next one. Okay, so. Did you sure? Oh, okay, yeah. So the issue with preferred uh, versus common stock, I think this was my slide, was. Um, the the, prefer, the the issuing of preferred stock keeps common stock affordable. So in particular, this applies to venture capital backed companies. Usually the founders and the employees are the common stock holders, and preferred stock is what the venture capitalists will, will, will buy. It, because there are preferences involved in preferred stock, which is why they call it that, it can have a higher price than what the common stock will have. It also usually puts in a liquidation scenario the preferred stock in front of the common stock. So the old rule was uh, a 10 to 1 ratio on the price. So if you have 10 cent common stock, you would have a dollar value preferred stock. Um, ignore that rule because it's not allowed anymore. Um, now you have to go out and get a valuation done. And uh, Jeff's got a whole presentation on valuation. <laughs> that rule. So you can do that yourself. <laughs> And uh, so we won't go through that very much. But another important point is if you're getting close to an in initial public offering, the gap between preferred and common starts to close because what happens in an initial public offering is all of the preferred stock converts to common. So the, those values need to start to come together. So that's just an accounting thing we've got. Um, the current rule, again, is the regular periodic uh, independent valuations of common stock if, especially in, if you're in a situation where you have a stock option plan and you're regularly granting stock options to your employees or your independent contractors who are working with you. Um, there's rules about that, so that's just a, a point to remember there. Um, and then again, with the first activity toward an IPO, you have to obtain a valuation and then instead of doing them once a year, you're more like doing them <coughs> Maybe often as, as much as uh, once a month, depending on how often you're granted. Okay, so now we're going to actually get into the meat of the conversation, which is cap tables themselves. The first question is exactly what is a cap table? A lot of you probably already know, but some of you don't. A cap table is basically a, a tabular presentation of your company's capitalization, including where it stands now and, and where you foresee it going in the future. So it'll usually have, we'll, and we'll show you some examples, but it'll usually have, along the left side of the chart, it'll have either the, the names of the shareholders or more likely the groups of names, like just founders or Series A or Series B. And then on the right, it'll, it'll be like the numbers of shares held by each of these groups and then the, the percentage of the outstanding capital that represents. So, so that's basically what a cap table is. So it's a listing of either the, the, the shareholders themselves or just the classes of shares and the number of shares outstanding and the percentage that represents in the company. And it also has a, it, they usually have a, a future looking component where, so it helps you kind of predict out in the future, it helps you have kind of like a road map that informs your current decisions of where you think you might be going and how many, you know, it helps you decide how many shares you want to issue now based if the contingencies that you think are going to happen in the future do happen and it, help, and, and it gives you a kind of a road map of, of where you're going. And the, you know, the stuff that's in the future is always 
just kind of an estimate and a prediction and it almost always changes, but, but it's important to have that to, to inform your, your current decisions. The cap tables can be more or less granular depending on how you like them and how you're using it. Um, and also the, 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 the stage of the company. In the early stages, they can be more granular, more granular because you have fewer stockholders. So you, you might actually list each individual person by name and the number of shares he or she owns and the percentage that, that represents of the company. The, 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 the more shares that are, the, more, the more, higher the number of shareholders and the more like different classes that are get out, get outstanding, the less granular it's going to get. So you might just say, like for example, founders might just be one, not, not individual names, and they might all together own a million shares. And then you might, if you had a friends and family round, you might have friends and family. And you might have Series A, Series B, you might have, you know, you'll have warrants and options, and you'll have um, the equity incentive pool, you know, which is basically a stock, stock option plan. So, one thing, I, one thing I wanted to say of what a cap table is not, is that it is not a stock ledger. How many people are familiar with a, what a stock ledger is? Okay, so a stock ledger is much more granular than a cap table, and it really does list every person's name, and it actually lists every stock certificate that's ever been issued. So it goes, and it just goes in by number, one, two, three, four, five, six, and who it was issued to, the date, and the number of shares, maybe who it was transferred to, and, and how many shares are still outstanding with respect to that certificate, which is sometimes it can be zero if, if all the shares were transferred. So it's just a listing all through, through time, of, and, and it stops at now. There's no future component to a stock venture. It's, it's just a snapshot of exactly who owns which shares now and how many shares now. The cap table is much more, much less granular and much more of a forward-looking component. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's designed to help you, um, help you make decisions. And that kind of leads into why you need a cap table and why you need to understand it. And, and obviously the first reason is just is to know who, who owns what. Who, who owns what percentage of your company. It's really important to keep track of that. And it's really important to document that. You know, the, it's, it's too common where I have clients that come in and say, well, you know, Joe owns 20% and Bobby owns 40% and Susie owns, and, and it's never been documented. And I, or maybe it was, maybe there was like a board minute, maybe there were board minutes or just somebody wrote, wrote notes on a conversation, or there have been some informal loose emails that have gone back and forth. But it's never, there's never been a board resolution authorizing the issues of shares to these people. There's no stock purchase agreement, there's no stock certificates, there's no stock ledger. Those people don't own any shares. Nobody owns any shares. You know, unless they can go into, into a court and prove by evidence that they own shares and not be on to have to go into that. So, so I see a lot of situations, for example, in, in the formation of a company or in the early months of the company where the founders are issued or granted founder shares, common stock, usually in exchange for their sweat and tears and intellectual property and that kind of stuff. And um, sometimes it gets on the cap table, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the times, unfortunately, it doesn't get into the accounting books. And, and then you have <coughs> your accounting books and your cap table out of sync. Um, so that's one of the reasons you, you need to keep your cap table and you need to sync it with your books as well as with your uh, attorney who may be keeping your stock ledger. So as an example, um, a large, large law firm keeps the stock ledger for one of my clients and every month because I've got the board meeting and other reporting requirements, I match the cap table that I keep in Excel to their records that they keep on file. And it's kind of interesting how many months I have to carry a reconciling item because it takes while for them to catch up on uh, granting a stock option or making uh, a change in a stock transfer and those kind of things. But uh, it's important to keep on top of that. And uh, um, so that way you know who, who owns what. Um, you'll know how many votes or shares you need to make a change. We talked about changing the capitalization of the company in the articles or certificate of incorporation. That's a shareholder vote. So you need to know how many how many votes you need to pass that kind of a resolution, um, and you need to make sure that you don't exceed your authorized capital. I have a story there where we, we this was a company that I think it was Series Series B, and we were moving towards Series C. We borrowed money from the venture capitalists who had already funded the company, 
And with that borrowing, there were issued warrants. And when it came around to December 31st, uh, we didn't realize till after the fact that we had actually exceeded our authorized capitalization with the number of shares that the warrants potentially could convert to when the notes converted. <coughs> And so it caused us a little bit of a, of a accounting issue at the end of the year when we went through the audit for that. Um, so that's so. Not only do you have to make sure that your authorized capital is greater than all of your outstanding equity that people actually hold, but it also needs to be greater than the outstanding equity that option holders and warrant holders potentially could owe or own. Right, an example, when those warrants and options are outstanding. John's absolutely right. For, for example, if you had nine, if, you, if your authorized capital was 10 million shares, and you have 9 million shares outstanding, meaning, meaning that they've been issued and, and people hold their stock certificates for those shares, and then you adopt an option pool covering 2 million shares. Now, those shares have not, they, 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 the, the options may not have been granted, or even if they're granted, the options may not have exercised their options and yet you're still basically in excess of your authorized capital. Yeah. You've got to kind of assume that those shares could be issued any day, so you better increase your authorized capital to cover those shares. The, the situation in the warrants that I was talking about, the warrants could convert to Series B shares, the shares already issued at the Series B price, or they could convert to the Series C shares. Series C had not been issued and had not been priced yet at that point. And so you, you, you don't have to take that into account, but you do have to assume that they'll convert to Series B shares at the Series B price, and there weren't enough authorized shares to cover that, that conversion at the point in time. So a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. If you issue more shares, you need the majority of what percentage? So issuing shares is different than authorizing shares. So is your question about issuing or authorizing? Well, so so it's a two-step process. Let's say first you need to have a sufficient number of authorized shares, and that and that needs to be on file with your state of incorporation. And then once you're past that, to issue more shares to one shareholder is probably a board approval, or does it require a shareholder no, approval? Board approval? Board approval if it's on conditions that are already acceptable to existing shareholders. Okay, so but if it's a new condition in terms, then that could be a different story. So the board can issue more shares, which will change the value of the shares everybody's holding at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It will diminish. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that a, a venture capitalist? Isn't that dangerous for them? It doesn't have a majority. Yes, which is why most venture capitalists control the majority in situations where they're investing. And that is a, There's a question back there. Right. Question real quick. The, um, what is, when is the realization of these shares actually put into the accounting practice, accounting table, so to speak, in the accounting practice? So, I mean, if you issue 10,000 shares, are those automatically listed as realized, or is it when people sell those shares, turn them in, or how does that all work? Are there different reasons to do that? I mean, do you want to always have them realized? So I'm not sure what you mean by realized. If, um, a, if a share is issued and numbered, it's outstanding. So it's on the cap table. Okay. If, a, if an option is issued, the shares related to the option are not outstanding until the option is exercised. That's a bad idea. So we have a slide and we'll be talking about um, actual outstanding shares versus fully diluted share count. So maybe that will help put that up in the yeah, slides. So, okay. so you, you, had, you had said something about um, if it's one shareholder, it only needs, if you're issuing shares to just one shareholder, it only needs board approval. So under what conditions would you need a shareholder vote and would the shareholder vote just be a simple majority? Okay, so that was the one was an example. So if a shareholder is coming in under the same terms and conditions as already exist with existing shareholders, mm -hmm. then nothing changes. You're just issuing more shares. You can do that. However, if a new shareholder is coming in and requiring different terms and conditions, mm -hmm. 
the existing shareholders typically have the right to approve or disapprove those new terms and conditions. Okay. So that's really what the issue is. That's why when, like if you're going from Series B to Series C, Series B is a term sheet, it's a proposed, this is what we want to do, and the Series B to Series A and the com common shareholders all get to vote on whether they're going to accept Series C's terms and conditions or not. And it's just a simple majority? Depends on the agreement of the B, A, and the common shareholders. They may have, in previous documents, decided that it needs to be a two-thirds majority. Okay. It just depends on what the agreements are. The default in the corporate code is a majority. Right. But the individual company and its investors can agree upon a supermajority if the investors insist on that. Okay. But the most important thing in my mind, the most use that I and my clients get out of cap tables is to kind of project possible future scenarios and make informed decisions based on those projections. So you've got your Excel spreadsheet, it's mostly Excel usually, and you have, your, you have some existing numbers and you want to play out various scenarios. So you, so you want to say, for example, um, what happens if we issue X number of shares, let's get to our, for example, to our, this new CTO that we're trying to hire. You know, what if we said we want to give him X percent of the company, how many shares is that? Or if, if, it's, if you're doing it by number of shares, well, how many, how, what percentage of the company is 2 million shares or whatever, 150,000 shares, and how much will that dilute everybody else? And you can just plug that, you can plug your, you, you've got formulas in your cap table. So if you just plug in there 2 million shares, it goes and it calculates what, what happens. And then you can, but and you can say, well, how about if we just give him one million shares? And you type in one million, and it goes and it calculates all the different, you know, the amounts that it that it to everybody else. And you know, you can do the same thing with a proposed financing deal, where you have, you, you know, you can plug in different variables, like for example, different pre-money valuations, or different dollar amounts being invested, or a different percentage of the company that the investors are asking to buy with that given dollar amount of money. And you can you can change the variables and you can predict what's going to happen. So, you know, the com if the company is pro pro um, provided with a term sheet by the investors, and the investors say, well, we want to buy 20%, we think you're, you know, worth four million now, pretty money, and we're going to give you, we want to put in a million in your company, so that'll make it be worth five million post money, we want 20%. Well, how, ma how many shares is that? And, and the cap table helps you figure out how many shares that is, and it shows how much ever, how everybody else gets paid. <coughs> so that's that's really the brilliant thing from with cap tables, in, in my experience. Okay. Would you uh, would you agree with that, John? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the other thing is like you know if you're if you're trying to figure out okay should we put you know how many shares should we put in our equity incentive pool? Should it be you know two million? Should it be three million? Um, what percentage of the company will that be? Usually, you, you talk percentage first. Like most, it's common to have it to be around 20 to 30 percent. But you, you know, you can plug in different numbers to figure out what what that percent is, and again, the effect of, of, of dilution on everybody else. Are you actually going to show us an example of? Yeah. 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 And, so you're talking about an incentive pool. Are you talking about um, stock or stock options or both? It can be either either or both. It can be restricted stock, it can be stock options, it can even be more exotic animals like RSUs and RSAs and things. So some of the pitfalls of not keeping a cap table is it can actually hold you up on making informed decisions. So I have a, a client who's got a real simple cap table. One person owns 50%, the other person owns 50%. That's what was in the articles of incorporation for the business. But there's no equity on the books. And so I was looking at this and trying to figure out. But your article said you each put in $100,000 for equity. How come there's no equity on the books? So we dug back seven years and ended up sort of converting some of the loan money that had been recorded on the books into equity money on the books. Because the intent at the time was equity, but nobody informed the accountant that that was what was going on. So we fixed it after the fact. But, it, but the, the reason it became important now is because it, this is a, a mother-son relationship. Son's ready to buy out mom and give her her retirement plan. 
And if you don't know how much she owns and what what her capital was is, and this is primarily a tax transaction, there's a lot of income taxes involved in this transaction, you have to go through and figure out what the, not only the percentage ownership of the company, but also the value of the company that, that the son is buying from the mother, so that the mother knows what her tax consequences are. Um, so it's just a real simple calculator table that wasn't translated to the accounting books that uh, we had to go back and fix. Um, if you don't keep it, you'll lose track of who owns what. And I've had those situations all over the place. Um, it's, it's usually, as I said, in, in the early stages of a company, either founder shares is, is promised to a founder and then it's issued, or more importantly, there's three or four or five or six consultants involved in the early stage of a company and they're each, you know, said, well, well, we'll get a 10,000 share option to you, and the option's never brought to the board and approved, so it's never papered and documented. So the consultant never has that option until maybe a seed or a Series A round comes up and someone's asking it, us to come up with a fully diluted cap table and all the details, and the founding CEO comes to me and says, do you have Joe and Larry and Sue and Fred in there? No, who are they? Well, I granted them each 10,000 share options, Two years ago. Well, do you got the documents on that? No. <laughs> so it's 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 it becomes a surprise because if anybody's seen a different cap table, now there's forty thousand shares out on that cap table that nobody knew about before. So that's sort of one of the examples to why you need to keep it uh, keep it going. We do have a couple of uh, uh, examples. This oh the, the other one is if you don't have a cap table, you look disorganized. To potential investors, and you don't want to pre present that. Okay, now you're talking all these different slices of stock. Mm -hmm. It's all out of the same pool. Yeah. It's not two 20 million plus 40,000 that you that's been promised. It's right. So out 20, of that 20 million. So in this example, 20 million was authorized, but um, we haven't even said how many are issued yet. So we're assuming that all of these shares are part of that 20 million at this point, yeah. But, but it's a good question because if it all adds up to 25 million, who would know? Because we haven't kept a captive yet. That's the point. It's, 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 if, you did, if you didn't keep track of it, you wouldn't know. So yeah, Chuck. John, John is a little aside to your, your verbal promise of granting options to a bunch of people. The consultant who have got granted is a very disadvantage because if the value of the company has gone up, he all of a sudden can be a taxable income for that amount if it's above what the valuation was when he thought he got the options, or, or when does the strike period start? There's all kinds of tax ramifications on the consultant. Right. So if those were promised, you know, in 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 month one at par value, let's say a tenth of a cent per share. Yeah. And it's two years later that we've learned about it, and we're catching up on the authorization and the paperwork. The company could be worth 10 cents a share. That's a big difference in the valuation to, to that consultant. Yes? Uh, would a cap table also be called a cap matrix? It might be. I'm not familiar with that term. Okay, I'm but not either. One of my examples here <laughs> might be the matrix you're talking about. Okay. Um, so how to keep your cap table. There's no single accepted format, and we're gonna show you a couple different formats so you can see it sort of blends and mixes. Um, name and class, number of shares, percentage owned. I use Excel, but there are software programs out there that will help you do this, and, uh, and those software programs will also help you do, do the calculations for stock compensation and some other things that you need. And there's also, um, stock plan uh, professionals, there's a uh, National Association of Stock Plan Professionals and certified professionals who are available out there who could help you keep this if it's not something you personally want to do. Um, so this is this is yours, yeah. right? so you go ahead and go through. This is the first example okay. of the cap table. So this is an example of a, a very simple streamlined cap table. This is that same company I showed you at the very beginning that has 20 million shares authorized. And that shows up right here. 
And this down, so down the left, we have the, the list of either shareholders or classes or groups of shareholders. And this one is so simple that it's okay to put, put the names. And this would actually, in, the, in real life, these would be two people's names instead of founder one and founder two. And you see that each of them was issued six million shares. So these are actually outstanding shares. And that equals 50% each. The, you calculate the ownership percentage based on outstanding shares. This is a common misconception. It's you know, the, the six plus six is equal to 12. So there's 12 million outstanding. That's what the number that you use to calculate the percentages. You don't use the 20. You don't use that. Even though conceivably at some point in time, those other 8 million shares could be issued and that would dilute these 50% numbers. As of, this moment, as of this moment in time, they each own 50% of the company. No question. So, um, so what's the guidance on figuring out how many shares you actually use? So, I mean, at a very extreme example, if there's two people and each get one share, they each own 50% of the company. So how do you determine what, you know, what guidance would you give to determine the number of shares that you're doing? Do you understand my question? Yeah, I do. And, and that is kind of what I was getting at when I was saying that you can use the cap table to look into the future and, and why you should always have some idea of where you might be going and what might ha what's your liquidity event, when you think it might happen, how many rounds of investment you think might happen before then. So you can, you can decide, well, I think we'll probably have X million shares outstanding by then. You know, let's say we think I think I'll have 20 million shares outstanding by then, and I want to have I want my guys to own uh, well, the founders want to own 30 percent each at that point in time. I think that's 30 percent. So that's how you use your cap table to look forward, okay. and that helps you inform that this could be, that helps inform you decide how many <coughs> shares to issue to these people now. And part of that is whether you're going to go public or not. If you think you're going to go public, you might issue more shares so that they'll so that it'll tie into the, 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 the number of shares that the underwriters want to sell to the public, and you, you know, hopefully you won't have to do a stock split to get them to the right number of shares. But you know, if, if you do have to end up with, I mean, all this stuff always, it, it almost always changes. You know, it's just like life. It always almost changes, but you need to have a roadmap. So now this is the same company, and here's, we have, oops, we have founder one and founder two again. No way that. There we go. And now they have hired their first hire contractor that they decided to issue 200,000 shares to. And they actually just granted him restricted stock. It's not a stock option. They granted him restricted stock. It's outstanding. So now there's 12,200,000 shares outstanding. And you see that that diluted each founder from 50% down to 49.18%. And the new person owns 1.64%. And again, the, the, the number that you calculate each person's percentages off of is based on the number outstanding, not the number authorized. Now, if instead of issuing one person 200,000 shares, let's say they adopted a stock option plan or an equity incentive plan with a pool of 3 million shares. Okay, now, those 3 million shares are not yet outstanding. Nobody owns them yet. But any investor who's calculating what percentage of the company their money is going to buy is going to assume that those shares will be issued. And therefore, they want to do the numbers based on the issuance of those shares so that, so that the issuance of those shares won't dilute them. Now we call, so we call that outstanding on a fully diluted basis. But if you take the two founders that own 12 million that are actually outstanding, and the 3 million shares that are covered by the equity incentive pool that will probably eventually be issued. Now we have 15 million outstanding on a fully diluted basis. And you can also, there can be other instruments that go into the calculation of, of what's fully diluted, such as warrants, or in some cases convertible notes, although it it's, it's, can be difficult to figure out how many shares convertible, convertible notes are convertible into. But anything that's out there where you know it's probably going to be issued and it's going to turn into stock, you, you assume it's been issued and you put that number in the, into your fully diluted capital. Mm -hmm. So in this case, on a fully diluted basis, each founder each owns 40%. And the option pool, the, the employees that are going to get shares through options or other forms of equity compensation, that pool owns 20%. Are there any questions at this stage? 
So when you, when you create an equity pool, is that something that you're formally doing, like it's written up and it's voted on, yeah. or is it just in your yeah. table? It's, it's it has to be passed by the board, okay. and then if you want the if you want certain tax and or security <laughs> law advantages, it also has to be approved by the shareholders. And it's a, it's a written document. It's usually an, an exhibit to board minutes. And it'll say, we the board hereby approve the, the option plan in the form attached as exhibit A here too. And then you'll also put it, you know, in, 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 in a PDF in your folder and also, in, I, I, like, if, if you're still doing paper, I'm still doing paper, it'll, be, it'll go in a folder in my folder in this company's stock option plan. You, you just put that an option plan, though, but it could also be restricted stock or I mean, <coughs> that doesn't have to only be options. That's right. Yeah. Can we move um, the stock from the equity pool back to the, say the, the not in the equity pool? You have to, yeah, you can, but you have to amend the the stock option plan or the equity incentive. <coughs> you have to actually amend it. Have to, there has to be a board resolution. If you want to decrease it, the board alone can decrease it. If you want to increase it, and, and again, you still want those same tax and or securities law advantages, the shareholders have to approve the increase. Um, when it comes to creating how many shares of stock, like let's say a company's value is <coughs> million, how many shares do you want to make available? I mean, does that vary per company or whatever? Let's say it's ten million dollars, you want to make five million dollars worth of stock available, <coughs> whether it's either to the public or in general. What is the guide? What are the guidelines? What are the, is there a best practice for that or anything? Or? It, it's your own. Circumstances <coughs> depends on what's going on there. So it'll, it'll again, usually, remember it's always changeable. There will usually already be a, a number in the authorized capital and some shares that have already been issued. So you kind of want to tie into that. But that's the perfect thing for a cap table. No, but I mean, I mean, I, I mean, like you know, when you first get the valuation, you say, oh, the company's worth ten million. We want to make. X amount of shares available to equal five million dollars, equal two million dollars. You know, how do you make those guidelines? And, you know, does it vary per company? Or, you know, what, well, it, it, so if you have a valuation of your company that's ten million dollars, you also have a different document that says how many shares are authorized, right. and you should also know how many shares are currently issued. <clears throat> I think the question, and we get this question a lot. So I'm not too. sure I understand the question. No, it's, I think what he's asking, and kind of the front row also asked this question, is why not issue one share each founder, each own 50 50% 50 each? What does it matter? And I think where it comes in, where an investor comes in and puts in, let's say, a million, mm -hmm. he doesn't want to get one share. Right. They don't want a million dollar price per share. So how, how do you guys deal with the number of shares outstanding? And what is the general rule? The bottom of it is psychological. Right. That's what I want to get at. It's if somebody not, want, like, if you're hiring a, hiring a CTO or even just like an engineer, they don't want to get like one or ten shares. They want to think, oh, I own 250,000 shares. Right, right. So you want to tie into that, and you want to tie into the. If, if you think you may go public, you want to tie into the 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 because the, the, the underwriters are going to want to raise a certain like hundred hundreds of millions of dollars. They want the, they always want the price per share to be within a certain range. So they don't they don't want it to be like two hundred dollars a share because nobody will buy it. So they want so you so you, you want to hopefully try to tie into the ultimate eventual IPO price, and that's based on the number of shares you do now. So I have a couple of slides on dilution as the company goes along, and maybe that will help answer answer your question. Yeah, and we do have to we have to move along, but maybe we'll just. Take oh, this might help clarify. I think you have to <coughs> don't lose the forest of the trees um, because I think this discussion is generally in the context of like venture back companies. So that's why you're seeing these like large numbers of shares. Mm -hmm. If you have sort of a garden variety company, you're not raising outside capital. It's a very closely held company. Then you could have a much fewer shares. I mean, okay. that's that's very yeah. permissible. Nothing weird about that. Yeah. Yeah. But again, the context of this is in a sort of a growth company, where you kind of keep the price lower for a lot of reasons. One is to, Rick's right, psychological because you're going to be granting stock options, and typically employees. It's hard to explain to them how the pricing of these, but what they like to say is, hey, I got options at 50 cents a share, even though they don't really know what that means. <laughs> but it psychologically makes them feel good like they got a low price. So there is a range. And then ultimately, when you go public, Rick's right. The, the underwriters, there, there is a, uh, there's a bit of, there's a science to where you price stock out when it goes public. And 
and even after it goes public, they sometimes make adjustments to see how much more market. A lot of times you'll see companies do stock splits where they're trying to increase the float and thus they think they're going to improve the stock price or get more buyers. But you can have high stock price. Look at Google. What's, if you just do that now, what's it trading at? Or Apple, they're at high prices. But So there's a lot of elements to that. We had, we had a client who, who was convinced he wanted a five cent option price because uh -huh. he wanted to signal that he was fairly early stage. We did the valuation was 50 cents per share and he said, can we use five? Well, we can't because it's not a fair market value. But you can split the number of shares mm -hmm. so that the share total increases so your price per share becomes five cents and that's a fair market value. Right. He was really dead set on getting a five cent price per share. Then, then you just split the share. So there is a lot of psychology behind mm -hmm. the share on the share. Okay, so did we finish this slide? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll just do this one really fast. This is okay. Now we. This is the same company, same scenario, but now we've done the Series A preferred. And the Series A preferred was that it was the numbers that I just said. They they came in hypothetically. They said we think your pre money is four million. And we want to put in a million dollars for twenty percent. So you you can use the cap table to calculate. Okay, twenty percent of the new number comes to three million seven hundred fifty thousand shares. And, and you see that, that that adds up with that all when you add up everything that's outstanding it's 18750 and 3750000 is 20% of that and it shows you how much these people got diluted from 50 down to 32 each and this was 20% down to 16% each so that's that's a great example of what a cap table can do for you and you can, you can plug in all sorts of different numbers here if you haven't really had your your conversations with your investors yet or you're getting kind of down the, down the road and some numbers are starting to be thrown out you can plug in different numbers in all those different variables and you can, you can come out with, with like how many shares will that be what percent will that be how much will this, these people be, will be diluted and of course the number of shares divided by the dollar amount they're putting in uh, comes to the um, per share price so you don't normally put valuations on that table no you no, do, no. do it separately yeah, yeah. So, so this is an example of a little bit more complex cap table, and this is this is a summary level table. So we've got common and preferred stock in three series, series A, B, and C. We've got a stock option plan, and we've got uh, warrants in series A. And so this tells you what our authorized number of shares are. This tells you the actual shares outstanding um, as if converted, and what that means is if, if the A or B or C converts to common at a different ratio than one to one, then that would be a, a different number of shares than, than, than what you have over here on a fully diluted basis. So as a percentage of uh, owned, this gives you an idea of the percentage of the company that's actually owned based on the outstanding. And then out here, the difference is on a fully diluted basis, all of the options would be considered as outstanding, and the warrants would be considered as outstanding. And both of those dilute the ownership of the common and, and the preferred shares. So it's just one, one format. And um, um, our hosts are going to make our presentation available to you, so, so you, you all get copies of this. Um, another way to look at uh, a cap table that's a little bit more detailed is um, by listing of shareholder or maybe shareholder groups and then across the top each uh, type of series that is issued. So this is common outstanding, this is preferred, the, uh, series A, series B, series C, and at the bottom of each you'll see I've got the authorized number of shares which is always more than the actual outstanding shares to make sure that we're covered on that cap table. Here's a subtotal column that says what the, what the total shares are outstanding and what that percentage is. So, you, so this shareholder one is a 33.8% outstanding shareholder. But then when you add in the options that are available in the warrants, shareholder one becomes a 29.3% shareholder on a, on a fully diluted basis because these additional um, options and warrants are outstanding. So I know that those, these options will convert to common shares when the person who owns the option exercises those shares, and the person who are people who own this warrant, those will convert to Series A. 
So that helps with the price of how uh, of what those will convert out. The, the price based on the granting of the option date and uh, and when the warrant was initialized. So those are all preset. Um, so that's sort of the examples of different forms of cap tables out here. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and maybe try to answer some of your questions about dilution. Um, and I've got about three minutes to do this, so I'm going to go real quick. So this is where Rick was talking about trying to plan ahead for your cap table. So let's say that in series A, you're 50% founders owners with 50% series A. You had, um, I've got some numbers on it later, so I won't do some numbers now. Um, in series B, you create an option pool that's 10% of the company, and a series B shareholder comes in and buys 30% of the company. So now, your 50% is diluted to 30%. And you can actually run the numbers to figure out the answers to these. In series C, we have a new shareholder coming in for 25% of the company, and um, I think we're refreshing the option pool. Well, no, the, the option pool stays the same, so it's diluted to 7.5%, and uh, founders are diluted to 22.5%. So then uh, a mezzanine round is sort of unusual. If you're going toward an initial public offering, you might have an a mezzanine round done by your investment banker to get you from the point where you've run out of cash on your Series C, and you're not quite ready to go uh, to go public yet. But that's going to cost you some dilution as well. So the question is sort of, is dilution a good thing? Um, in this particular example, <coughs> it is. And I'll show you why. Um, initially, the company was valued at um, $1 million. Some Series A put in a million to get their 50%, and so it was valued at $2 million post money. Through all of these series and rounds, the value of the company on a per share basis increased. And at the end, even though the founders started at 50% but got diluted down to 15%, <coughs> that's a big dilution, um, their 15%, excuse me, plus I have employees, so, so $100,000, so I, the, the founders plus all of the employee options is 25% on a $100 million company, that's $25 million. That's a lot more than the million dollars that they started with. So in this happy scenario, suffering <laughs> dilution is okay because the value keeps going up and eventually you'll cash out, you know, like Google and Yahoo did right? and Facebook. Um, but what happens if you have a down round? So a down round is basically really bad news. And I'm going to skip this percentage chart and go to the dollar chart. Um, in this particular scenario, uh, series D got stuck in, so it's a new round that wasn't in the previous chart. And series D says, well, you know, you've missed all your milestones. You think your company's worth this, but I want 50% of your company and I'm only willing to put in $2 million. So your company is only worth, uh, excuse me, 10%, yeah, well that was the message. 50% and your company is only worth $20 million. So I'll put in my piece to get, you know, my 10 million to get my 50%, and everybody else is going to be drastically reduced, diluted. So in this end scenario, instead of 25%, your founders and employees are only 14%, and um, so that's a lot less than if you hadn't had to do this down round, but it is still more that, than what you started with. But there are cases where you can end up with nothing out here based on dilution. But having your cap table and understanding how you can project it out gives you that um, ability to sort of try to see this out in the future. And for each one of these rounds, the articles of incorporation, the authorized capital, it all got changed. It all got changed, especially when Series D came in. It's potentially all of the rights and preferences that Series A, B, and C had up to that point. Series D came in and said, well, I want 50% of the company, and I want uh, all of their preferences knocked down a little bit or something. And uh, so they, and, and because their decision point at that point was go out of business, 
<laughs> or take more money and see what we can do. They decided to take more money and accept the terms and conditions and continue running the company. But the alternative is always there. It's just shut the doors and walk away. So um, then the last sort of piece is who do you need to include in the conversation? Well, there's a pretty good list. Your CEO, your CFO, your attorney, your CPA firm, your board of directors. And so what I find a lot, in a lot of situations where the CEO has said, hey, consultant, I'll give you a stock option, it never gets to the board of directors, so they, didn't, they never approve it. They don't tell the CFO, so the CFO can't track it with the attorney to make sure it gets papered and documented, and those kind of things. So having a document that is a cap table where I can sit down with my CEO and say, this is what I think we got in our cap table, and then the CEO can say, well, you missed Larry, Joe, and Curly, you know, then you, know, you go back and do that. So if I'm that consultant, what document should I expect, which is really solid? As a consultant for, for what? I have 10,000 stock options, let's say. Yeah, you what need document a, should I expect? You, you want a stock option grant. Right. Uh, signed by the board. No. It's not necessarily signed by the board. It's usually executed by the CEO of the company. And if you've got that, then it's been through, the, you can probably safely assume it's been through the board approval and, uh, and it's on the cap table. Yeah. If I may add, I go sure. through this a lot with my clients, and I had a client last year, I spent the whole summer reconciling yeah. commitments, and um, if you have concerns, and I don't think it's really out of order to say, has this been approved by the board yet? Just to check in, I would, you know, informal email to your CEO that you're working with to say, you know, what was the board date that this was approved? Uh, just so you have that comfort of knowing, because if they can't give you a date, then you may not have... If, if you have an offer letter of employment or if you have a consulting agreement and in either one of those documents it says we're going to give you a 10,000 share option, you don't have a stock option. All you have is a consulting agreement or an offer letter for, of employment. But e either one of those documents is not a stock option. And so if that's all you have, you don't have your stock option. If anyone would like the, the um, that, that very simple cap table I showed at the beginning, if you want a, a, a generic version of that with no numbers in it, feel free to come up afterward and give me your business card or shoot me an email and I'm, I'm happy to send you that the Excel file that that was based on. You can also find things like that online too. Yeah. I am a certified equity professional and, and do all of this, the cap table, the stock option programs. And I have business cards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good resource. So that's the formal presentation. This is our contact information. It's interesting that the uh, the next seminar is on how to create a company name. Just like ASL CPA, I thought it'd make it easy. Just back to CFO. <laughs> <laughs> um, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, I come up. Uh, with this particular issue a lot with mm -hmm. many of my early stage clients and I just say call your counsel but I'm curious if I can give a more informed answer. So I have a lot of early founders who you know they've done their sort of bank with a little company in Delaware and they get their sort of bank and maybe some really vanilla bylaws mm -hmm. and then oftentimes there will be a board consent that says founder A you have 4 million shares and founder B you have 3.5 million shares and then nothing ever happens again. And then I get called in when they want to go into a round and I go through and I say, oh, well, this is kind of an issue um, that I can't resolve because I'm not a tax specialist and I'm not a lawyer. So what do you advise to people who've not, you know, done the founder's agreement? Uh, for me, the biggest issue is the a b They've not filed that. So what, how, how do you like to fix those issues? Fix them or prevent them? Well, my clients are already happening. I would love to prevent them, um, but I don't seem to get called early enough. Yeah. So, um, so on, on the fixing side, uh, like you, I go to the attorney and say, how do we how do we fix this? On the on the prevention side, it's really really easy to prevent. If you're a founder and you're issuing or granting yourself stock and it's at a tenth of a cent a share. Just multiply the tenth of a cent 
times the number of shares and write a check to your company. Write a personal check okay. to your company, deposit it, you'll get it back on an expense report somewhere. And then you're done. And you have proof that you bought those shares at the time you bought those shares. Mm -hmm. That's but the best way to know, do it. Do you know what the implications are for not filing any freebies uh, by any chance? Like, yeah. I just don't even know. Only I'm always following on time. If just founders talk to me and automatic A3B, it's only if you restrict them. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, the A3B is, sure. is, is primarily if the if that founder stock is issued is immediately subject to some sort of vesting or, or, or buyback provision. Okay. So Which sometimes the they founders don't, do that, don't usually do to themselves. No. That's the way you put restrictions on once they put yeah. money in. But then you need to make sure that A3B is done after restrictions get put on there. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. That is okay. extra helpful. So okay. 30, 30 days. days. Yeah. 30 days. From yeah, the 30 now. days I know. It's, it's, it's the other piece that causes me stress. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one more question. If there is one. Okay, these guys will stick around for a little bit after. Thank you very much. We're